Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast with me, Conor Whiteley, psychology student and international best-selling psychology author of over 30 psychology books, bringing you the latest psychology news, fascinating psychology topics and more each week. If you want to learn more, then please check out conorwhiteley.net forward slash books. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube video or follow on your favourite podcast app. And here's the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 243 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Connor Whiteley. And today's episode is on what are child and adolescent mental health services. So this is a really fun podcast episode that I really enjoy like, writing about because it's an extract from one of my brand new books which we will talk about later in like today's episode and this really useful a podcast episode helps you to understand especially in like the UK how do um, children and adolescent mental health services work, how they're structured what they do and it also introduces you to some of the different professionals that are, that are actually work in them because surprisingly enough they're not all um, psychologists. This is a really useful quite um, eye-opening podcast episode for people that are brand new to this um, area. And it's Friday the 15th of December 2023 as I record this. So moving on to the psychology news section, we're reading from the British Psychological Society Research Digest and the first one is brilliant, I think. So, open quote, psychology measures aren't toothbrushes, close quote. And then open another quote, psychological constructs and measures suffer from the toothbrush problem. No self-respecting psychologist wants to use anyone else's, close quote. So begins a productive comment paper in a communication psychology. In this paper, Maud Elson at the University of Burton and her colleagues call for an urgent change to this situation and proposes new standardisation of behaviour research guidelines, also known as SOBER guidelines which aims to promote the use of standardised measures. Most psychological measures are only used once or twice, the team writes, with tests that are widely reused, almost all belonging to clinical psychology. Yep, yep, which is always good. Though, at first glance, it might seem like a good thing to investigate a phenomenon using different measures. The team argues that there are major downsides to vary in them so regularly. Open a quote. We argue that proliferation is in fact a serious barrier to cognitive science. Close quote. So this I think is really quite interesting. I think this is actually quite fascinating. Because of course all of you guys know probably like by now my background is very much clinical psychology. And I mean, when I first read this, I was like, oh, right, I don't really think this is true whatsoever. Because, of course, in clinical psychology, we we are always using repeated measures. Most of our measures have been very well validated, very well documented, and they've been around for ages. Well, for ages, though, because in my current trans research, I'm using, or oh, right, so there's about three. There's one that's very new, well, very like new though, but that's because trans research is very new. I'm also doing the mental health inventory five, which is a five item one. So I picked that one up because that one's been quite that, quite well validated and that's been used quite a lot. And then I've also done an even better um, one that's been very well researched and I've seen that constantly is the depression anxiety stress um, scale something like that like DRS or whatever so in like clinical psychology I don't think this is as much of a problem but if we look at other um, fields of like um, psychology 
Yes, they have always created like brand new models, brand new scales, and brand new ways to test stuff, which I think is absolutely brilliant because it means we can test more stuff. But as they say, the problem if you keep using different like measures is that one that you actually aren't building valid well validity for a particular model, and also and also they're like as a personal note because I because I was actually in involved in creating a social media scale during my placement year. I have no idea what actually happened to that. I should actually like find out more, but um, it takes a lot of work. I mean, like the amount of testing you need to do, the amount of literature you need to read, that is that that is a, like an extreme amount of uh, of like work. Though, so to be honest, using different measures and actually helping to build an evidence base for a reliable um, type of scale is probably in the best interest of everyone, which is what this paper is saying. It's also probably more time effective for researchers just so we can focus on actually testing a behavior finding more actually contributing more to the literature and also i don't know why psychologists wouldn't want to test other models because i think that's actually quite fun because if you test it and if it works that is brilliant because you will get to add to the literature and you get to help um validate a like brand new model which is always a good but if it doesn't work well then it gives you something interesting to write about but uh, so i don't even think we do need to step forward from this toothbrush problem problem though because there are some good um, um scales out there and they would be even better if they were more valid and there was more research to see supporting them so i don't know just, I don't know, like, just to fall, like, I'm definitely not a psych, a psychometrician or whatever the word is, but I think it'd be very interesting. And if this is anyone's um, area of, like, of expertise, then please get in touch. I would love to know your thoughts on this. Undervaluing kindness starts early. Acts of kindness make the giver as well as the recipient feel good. The research shows that we systemically underestimate how well other people will respond to a range of positive acts, or this will be good for me, including giving compliments, expressing gratitude, providing social support, and performing a random act of a kindness. This may result in us unnecessarily holding back from doing things that would boost other people's well-being, as well as our own. So far, much of the research focusing on undervaluing kindness has been on adults. Now though, Margaret Echebar at Stony Brook University and Nicholas Epley at the University of Chicago report that even children as young as four make the same mistake. So this, I think, is personally quite an interesting one because of my past and also because I'm all autistic. Well, because I have problems um, understanding other people's emotions, I sort of do the opposite. I sort of do the opposite, but I also get this problem quite horrifically. Because when I do want to be genuinely kind to someone, I tend to overdo it and tend to and I tend to be really intense, apparently, and quite a few people have told me that. So nowadays, I am sort of like, oh, what's the point of being like kind? Because, because people just think I'm in their tent, and that always like backfires. Of course, that isn't the case at all. It's just I need to find the like middle ground, and most of the time, I do actually do it like quite well. And people do generally like it when I'm kind to them because it makes them feel well good. Because I know how to make people feel good. It's just I need to find the right balance. So it's always quite an interesting one. And then if we look more broadly. Well, I think we definitely do underestimate the acts of kindness because um, I was doing some writing now for a new um, psychology book today and I was ended up paraphrasing 
um, Gandalf in The Hobbit because of his acts of kindness. Because there's a bit in the, the film which is where Gandalf is talking about, oh yeah, like it's the small acts of kindness that keeps evil at bay. It's not the big, like major life changing stuff. And then I was like talking like about that in like the book that because it's definitely true. And it also fit with the subject area that the books on like are quite nicely. So I think the main takeaway from this um, psychology news article is it definitely just be kind. If you think that something is actually going to make someone happy, then do it. Don't underestimate it. Of course, don't be intense, don't be creepy and stuff like that. But if you know that someone's going to be happy by your act of kindness, then do it. So the last one is, AI faces seem realer than real. Recent advancements in artificial intelligence have led to the creation of hyper-realistic faces that can often pass as human. Whilst this is a known issue, a new study conducted by Elizabeth J. Miller and her team at Australian National University has shed light on an even more concerning problem. Not only are AI-generated faces virtually indistinguishable from human faces, but white AI-generated faces are actually perceived as more human-like than real human faces. This peculiar phenomenon of perceiving artificial faces as more human than actual faces is referred to as hyperrealism. The implication of this study are significant as it raises questions about the future of AI and its potential impact on society. It is clear that AI technology continues to advance. It will become increasingly difficult to, differ to differentiate between what is real and what is not. So there's definitely not a great amount that I can actually say about, about this psychology news article, except that I think this is concerning. I don't think it's scary. I think there will have to be a lot more research into other ways to overcome it um, and how does this impact our cognition and how, and to be honest, how does this impact crime? Well, like a crime though. I definitely think cognitive psychology, forensic psychology, probably even social psychology will get a lot of research out of this topic. Topic though, but I think that yeah, I think this is this is definitely a cause for concern, and I think that if the governments eventually get around to regulating AI, I think they will have to address this. But I don't think that's happening anytime soon. I know the EUs are doing quite a lot of like quite impressive stuff about AI, but I think that's it at the moment. That and of course you always get the major problem of regulation. I will always, always fall behind the advancements in the technology. So I really hope that you enjoyed the psychology news section. So let's move on to the personal update. So we're moving on to the personal update. So it's been the last week of a term at the university and I've really enjoyed it. It's actually been quite a good week. Not quite as good as like last week, but it's been a very average week where not a lot has actually happened. Granted, I've been swept off my feet trying to take advantage of the university Wi-Fi for all of my, well, for all of my different projects. And I'm very grateful that Wednesdays I'm basically at the university the entire day. So that was really useful. Well, useful though. But I, I went to a, like, a, a, a Christmas party with one of my social groups. And then there's just like small other things that have been like going on with the family. But as the uh, Christmas season like uh, draws near, well, I'm very much having to realise. I have tons of statistics revision to do because of all the statistics problems we've been having at the university with our horrific lecturer. So all of us, we've definitely been doing like revision plans. Apparently there's going to be a group study session, which I have actually got to go on the WhatsApp to find out about. So thank God I'm actually doing this a podcast episode. Otherwise I would have like really forgotten. 
So now we're going to be basically got 12 weeks of statistics to cram in four weeks. And all of it is basically going to be self-taught. So that will be interesting and rather fun. Not. <laughs> Besides from that, life is very good. Well, look at that. And I'm looking forward to wrapping up projects, the like a Christmas Day stuff, and in the and in a join of the new year and i can't believe we're almost in 2024 that is quite mad mad that we're, but i have actually got some really fun uh, podcast episodes planned uh, including um one on so the first one in the new year which i think is going to come out on new year's day that one is uh, going to be on emdr which i am actually quite e e excited about about it because because I've had a quick look at it and it turns out it can be a bit controversial but but there's lots of evidence in support of it so that will be quite interesting yep and then I've got something on um on the psychology of loneliness and also I might do a 2023 year in because there's lots of points I want to make about mental health being an aspiring psychologist and basically x y and z so tons of uh, great episodes that I'm looking forward to and as always I love to hear your thoughts and feelings on today's episode so you can always email me connorwiley.net you can always leave a comment on the blog post at connorwiley.net forward slash podcast and you can always tweet me on Twitter at Sci-Fi Whiteley. I always love to hear from all of you because it really helps make the podcast feel more like a conversation. And you can also leave a comment on the Facebook post at Connor Whiteley Psychology Offer. And today's episode has been sponsored by Working on with Children and Young People, a guide to clinical psychology, psychotherapy and mental health. So this is an absolute brilliant book which I'm really excited about because it goes into so much great depth for, because it goes into so much great depth for, about how a clinical psychologist and other mental health professionals because there's actually quite a lot which this book really talks to me about how many different like mental health professionals like there actually are and to be honest clinical psychologists are like a tiny fraction of a team team though and then there's so many different professions like around which is actually which is actually brilliant so but this is a great really easy to un understand book actually it talks about uh, the uh, cam services which in uh, the uk is the child and adolescent mental health services and then it also talks about tons of other different like uh, services for example how might a, a clinical psychologist actually help a, a child or a like young person? It also talks about paediatric psychology, which is a lot more interesting than I ever wanted to admit. But then it also talks about how clinical psychologists, to very much psychologically focused people, can actually help people with uh, chronic illnesses. So where well, that definitely I see applies to me because. I didn't think uh, people that would be that interested in uh, the uh, psychological aspect of life and conditions uh, might actually be able to help uh, um, people with uh, phys physical illnesses. Uh, that, was, that was actually a like great section as uh, like research write up and actually like look at in in a lot more depth. So I definitely recommend getting this book. It's a lot of fun and that you'll definitely learn a lot. I know that I did and I'm really, really happy about that. So with that is a working knob with children and young people, a guide to clinical psychology, mental health and psychotherapy. Available with all major ebook retailers and you can get the paperback and the hardback that in from Amazon, your local bookstore or local and local libraries if you request it. So whilst buying books helps to support the creation and the editing of the podcast, my time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. And if you wanted to become a patron and get tons of great rewards, rewards and access to a great patron community, then you can at patreon.com forward slash the psychology of podcast. So that's enough for the personal update, let's move on to the content part of today's episode. 
So uh, moving on to the content part of today's episode. So we're going to be talking about what are CAM services, which are the Children and Adolescent Mental Health Services in the UK. But to be honest, a lot of this probably does a tr- does a translate to basically all the Western countries. So even though they're going to be set up a slightly differently and run differently, the core basic principles are actually um, almost certainly exactly the same across the world. So just something to bear in mind. So let's dive into it. We already know from the last chapter that Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services are a UK service and they are a service that children and younger people will go to for psychological treatment. Building upon this further, CAMs are mainly run by the UK's National Health Service, NHS, and local government services with the NHS services in England being commissioned by the Clinical Commissioning Group. And if you wanted to learn more information about the uh, um, commissioning groups, then there's a website link on the uh, blog post. Therefore, uh, these are clinical commissioning groups are in the charge of deciding what services are needed and then they will commission them. Some of the services they're in charge of commissioning include mental health services, elective hospital services, urgent and emergency care, as well as community care. This is basically an internal market inside the NHS, which is always a great topic for debate. And there is always, always tension between these commissioning groups and healthcare providers because these commissioning groups can need to use third party healthcare providers like private hospitals for waiting this initiative. Personally and from what I understand from listening to other clinical psychologists this situation is not ideal, it seriously isn't, but it's needed, it's the world we live in and it will flat out not change. Since it would be nice if the NHS could be self-reliant and use all of its money on itself and its, and its client because of staffing as shortages, including their rubbish pay, their inherent problems with the NHS's structure and everything else that is chaotic about the public sector, it's a shame that the NHS has to shell out large sums of money to these third-party providers to ensure that the clients uh, get seen. Anyway, uh, clinical commissioning groups are membership bodies with local doctors uh, being their members. Also, these uh, groups are led by elected uh, governing bodies made up of medical doctors, other clinicians like uh, nurses and secondary care consultants, as well as lay members. And also, I didn't put this in the um, blog post, but as you can tell, The thing about that is there were basically no psychologists in those, which if you're setting up mental health um, charities, mental health services, wouldn't that be the logical place to start? Okay then, Uh, that's all I'm going to say about this. In addition, these uh, clinical commissioning groups are responsible for about two thirds of NHS England's total budget. That was... uh, basically 80 billion in 2019 to 2020. Whilst these clinical commissioning groups are technically independent of of the government, they are accountable to the UK's Secretary of uh, of the State for Health and uh, Social Care through NHS England, which is important when we consider they're responsible for the health of populations ranging from under 100,000 to over a million people but the average uh, population is about a quarter of a million people. Going back to CAMS. So we actually needed to take that little bit of a detour. So we you know how CAMS um, are set up in the first place. But anyone who has any professional contact with uh, well, with uh, children can be considered as a part of a CAM service. This is a potentially in addition to with the list of uh, of fellow workers uh, that I give you in the next chapter. However, more often than not, these are uh, these are days 
CAM services are being provided by other agencies that aren't the NHS, like local councils. And I think whether this is good or bad really depends on the local council and the individual provider, since I can easily imagine how local authorities with larger budgets and access to great professionals will be rather good at this. But others that have smaller budgets and don't have access to the best professionals, they will certainly struggle to provide the best care possible. Furthermore, when it comes to these extra providers that are outside the NHS, these have to be quali qualified providers, of a course, and there's a contractual system within the NHS internal market made up of the English NHS. This internal market was introduced by the Labour government in 2009 to 2010, when it was called Any Willing Provider. This policy has never been reappealed and the policy has continued and was accelerated under the newly formed coalition government that rose to power in 2011. Then the government changed its name to any qualified provider. The implementation of the policy was achieved through the NHS operating framework as well as by having a strong central team based in the Department of Health that oversaw and supported its implementation at a local level. Yet it was bad that it didn't receive any statutory instruments to achieve its aims and even worse, this policy was often wrongly considered as part of the reforms associated with the Health and Social Care Act 2012. An example of a provider and wrap up. So it truly seems that the Virgin Group is involved in everything from planes to space to, te to technology, but it's also involved in healthcare settings. And I want to say up, like, up a front that I have no problems with like, massive companies. And in this case, Virgin is actually very good news for a lot of people. As a result of Virgin Care, has a total of 400 services in total across in England. From way down in the southwest in, in Wilshire, right up to Teesside in the northeast. And Virgin Care has a lot of children and young people mental health services as well. So to start wrapping up this chapter, the entire point of any qualified provider was to improve the number of, uh, of uh, choices as patients have in England because there used to only be the NHS and I suppose that some people wanted other choices. I don't know why but, but I guess that that's fair enough. Also, CAM provisions are varied and it's rare that two, two aren't ever exactly the same and this can uh, be seen in, in uh, dependent for profit counselling services and virgin care when they compared when they compared to each other, let alone the NHS. Therefore, CAM services are for children and young people from a birth up a, up a to the age of eighteen or up to twenty five for young people and children as part of a wider network of of vast supports for looked after children. For example. Children are leaving the uh, the foster care system or special educational needs. Whether these services are being based anywhere that children are. For example, medical practice, children development centres, and we talk a lot more about them later on in uh, the book because there's an entire section dedicated to them. Clinics, hospitals and children's centres. And the aim of these services are to provide a assessment and a, and a treatment of young people and the children who have behavioural, emotional and their mental difficulties. But now we know what CAMs are, what evidence is there that they're actually needed? So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode and you got something out of it. Well, I know that I did because the two chapters after this are that are actually going to talk about children's mental health. It's absolutely brilliant. 
a little heartbreaking to some extent well a similar but because the numbers are so high up but it but it's really interesting a chapter and to be honest it was actually quite fun re reading the whole clinical commissioning group well, group stuff over because i've actually been talking like this year it was back in october with someone who actually used to be an nhs commissioning officer so in a few years when I do an updated edition, I will definitely have to put that in. But there's a podcast episode I finished this week. It won't be out for quite a while because of my scheduling. But I do actually talk about more about how that works. Works over so really interesting stuff. Children and adolescents, mental health, absolutely critical. And if you know someone who would enjoy today's episode then I please share it with them. I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help us with the words about the podcast. And if you wanted to learn more, definitely check out Working With Children and Younger People, available in all the usual places. And if you want to become a, a patron, then you can at patreon.com forward slash the psychology world podcast. Or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Connor Whiteley. So have a great day everyone and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. Please remember to like the video and subscribe to the, the YouTube channel and follow the podcast on your favourite podcast app. And if you wanted to learn more then please check out the backlist of the podcast episodes or my books at conwhiteley.net. So have a great day and I'll see you next time.